Uh, this morning, I want to introduce a highly respected friend of mine, uh, uh, Dr. David Lim. Uh, you need to, uh, he is the board chair of Luzon, Philippines. Uh, you need to know GDN uh, is connected to Luzon. Uh, he is the board chair for the Philippines board, and, uh, and he is also the coordinator of the Asian House Church Movement. If you want to know about uh, the intricacies of uh, house church movement, you need to talk to him. I had a great time spending time with him in Rome a few months ago when we were there for the Lausanne consultation on nominalism. And uh, I learned uh, many, many aspects of the house church movement that is growing uh, profusely throughout Asia and even in China. Uh, he, he, uh, he's, he's also president of China Ministries International Philippines. Need to know, uh, he had also an academic background. He was academic dean of Asian Theological Seminary right here in Manila. He was also academic dean of the Oxford Center for Mission Studies. Uh, this morning, as he comes to present to us hybridity in the Bible, uh, he comes with uh, the qualification of being a long-time teacher uh, of God's Word, and he has a PhD in New Testament theology from Fuller Theological Seminary. So welcome Dr. David Lim uh, this morning. Thank you very much. Uh, very much. Uh, uh, TV, I didn't expect to be introduced uh, so co uh, comprehensively. Um, uh, perhaps my best qualification is I stand before you as a hybrid myself. Uh, my parents uh, migrated from China, so I'm a second generation uh, believer. Uh, Chinese, fifth generation from China, and the, uh, it thanks to the Irish and Scottish Presbyterians who came to, uh, to Xiamen and, and the surrounding areas uh, to plant uh, the church there, and my great-great-grandfather was one of the first converts there, and became a minister, and uh, who started a who almost made a vow to the Lord that whoever is the firstborn uh, in his clan, uh, as, as they get produced, uh, they should become full-time Christian ministers. And so I'm the firstborn of the firstborn of the firstborn of the firstborn of that guy. <laughs> and with all the hybridities that came in along the, uh, along the way, uh, the blessing is, of course, uh, to grow up as a fifth generation Christian, alive, alert, and enthusiastic for the Lord and the Great Commission. How did that happen? Well, uh, the experience of hybridity that produces people who are committed to the mission day uh, can be passed on for generations. And hopefully, uh, you will get that hint uh, from here. Because uh, as I am privileged to be requested to give the last, uh, the, the third and last uh, devotions uh, with hybridity in the Bible, I picked uh, in order to uh, focus on the theme, uh, how then must we do? <laughs> as the last devotion, I must be sharing uh, what then with all the good presentations that we've had uh, the papers that have enriched me, and I really enjoyed uh, almost all of them, uh, and really say that thank God for all those uh, insights that we have, that uh, to realize now that this world is not just hybrid, but it is in a rapid hybridization, hybridizing uh, process, and just in our generation, uh, having now 
I'm now going to be 65 at, uh, by September. I can see that as my children grew up, as millennials, the kind of rapid change. And we have now not just entered virtual reality, we will soon have automated reality. And for those of you who watched the movie that was mentioned yesterday, we talked about augmented reality. And so the, ra the rapid changing because of new intercultural uh, happenings, transnational uh, happenings will increase and not decrease. In this context, as we go back to our context where we know changes will be happening so fast that new wineskins should be multiplying fast too to cope with this situation, I hope we can learn from the best diaspora missiologist in the Bible. His name is no other than the Apostle Paul, who was a hybrid, uh, a Jew who was raised in Tarsus and most probably studied in the University of Jerusalem in order to become a Pharisee a master, a PhD in the Torah, in the law, and who also had the privilege of not having just Aramaic or, or, or Hebrew, but Greek as his mother tongue, almost. Huh? And a Jew uh, who uh, would be used by God to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, the non-Jews. And now, in the Bible, there is a real hybrid, a person who is mixed blood, and that person is Timothy, who was part of his team that was trying to evangelize the whole Roman Empire, and they did it in seven years with three missionary journeys, and Timothy joined the team in the second missionary journey. And Timothy was witness to what Paul was doing, uh, this hybrid of a Jewish mom and a Greek dad uh, was being encouraged from the second letter to Timothy. And so we'll be studying a portion of the Bible to Timothy 2 verses 1 to 10 to learn of the three things that Paul was doing and was advising and reminding Timothy uh, as, uh, and he didn't realize at that time, this most probably was the last letter uh, he would have read, uh, he, he would write. So from a veteran diaspora, uh, I would say reflective practitioner, <laughs> the missiologist, what do we learn from the Apostle Paul on how to face the pluralistic Roman Empire with full of Greek and Roman gods and being successful about it? Because in Romans chapter 15, he says, after these three missionary journeys, I have no more areas to evangelize and make into disciples. No more nations to disciple. Because I have now got to go to Spain and I'm sure that if he was not arrested and brought back to Rome, he would have, said, within two years, said that I'm on my way now to Gaul, to France, and then another two years, perhaps, uh, to uh, uh, the British Isles and, and get the Anglo-Saxons uh, to Jesus. But how was he able to do it? Because of these three important uh, elements of the reminders that Paul would give Timothy. And it's very simple. Uh, uh, what then must we do? Well, for Paul, his advice to Timothy at the last days of his life uh, were three. In verse 1 of 2 Timothy, verse 1, I would talk about simple spirituality. 
from verses 2 to 7 would be simple strategy. And in verses 8 to 10, simple structure. Wow. You can realize now I'm an expository preaching. Thanks to God for my beginnings at the age of 16 to become a entrepreneurial visionary. An intervarsity chapter in my university. And during that time, as a freshman in college, I learned how to multiply God's word across not just my campus, but other campuses in Bacolod, uh, my hometown, and see to it that uh, <clears throat> God's word was multiplying uh, across the universities in Bacolod, being the, uh, appointed, uh, chosen to be the chairman of the Bacolod Leaders Council of the five intervarsity groups uh, in Bacolod. First, in chapter 2, verse 1, this single verse is the summary of the sp spirituality that was going to be propagated all across the Roman Empire and across the world. I normally ask people to, <laughs> uh, why, why do I add the word simple? I normally uh, give them a, my own uh, understanding that God loves the whole world. He wants all to be saved and all to come to repentance and that no one should perish. And in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, it says there that God wants that all men will be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. All men. All men and women, in other words, and all people. Now, if God, the all-wise God, and this all-loving God wants to get the whole world to know the gospel of the kingdom and be saved, and to know the knowledge of the truth, would he give his disciples, his church, a simple way to evangelize the world or a complicated way to evangelize the world? And thank God, the all-wise God gave us a simple plan to get the world evangelized. And that I found during my freshman year for my MDiv at Asian Theological Seminary where I learned this book by Robert Coleman, The Master, God's Master Plan for World Evangelism. Unfortunately, it is good in the theological libraries, and it is good for some personal libraries, but it is hardly practiced by the church as we shall see what Paul was saying to Timothy. Uh, the simple spirituality is us. Uh, let me read it. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Very simple. Be strong, for he is writing to a teammate uh, who is a bit shy, introvert like me. Uh, a, somebody who uh, seems not to be sure about what he is doing. But all over scriptures, actually whenever uh, people are going to be used by God mightily, there is always a be strong to Moses, then to Joshua, and that we go into the world, into the mission field as lambs among wolves, as Jesus clearly told his disciples. And to face the Muslim, uh, not just in the Muslim countries, but those in our diaspora gateway cities, where the intermix of Iranians and uh, Palestinians and uh, Sudanese, uh, Sudanese are, well, it looks fearful. And in the Greek and Roman god filled Roman Empire, Timothy uh, 
serving in Ephesus and later on in uh, some other places assigned by Paul or sent out by Paul had to deal with this and to be confident to know that you are in the grace of our Lord Jesus this is very important because if a person's spirituality does not give, provide him a clear sense of self-confidence uh, to be able to be an instrument of the grace of God, uh, uh, they uh, can do much. What is the grace of our Lord Jesus? Well, uh, there are two uh, important aspects to it. A worldview and a life view. And Normally, I cross-refer now to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 4 to 5, as the, the, the theology, the worldview that every Christian should have in order to be strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus. The grace. Grace is God's undeserved favor. God loves you as a sinner and has a wonderful plan, not just for your life, but for your community and for the world. And that the kingdom of God, the lordship of Christ, will be not just in you, but in your family, in your community, among your people group, and around the world. And 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, in the midst of the teachings that Paul was planting the worldview uh, uh, across the Roman Empire, uh, he mentioned two things. First, our view of the world as we face it with confidence, knowing the grace of God is there, is to say that everything that God created is good. Genesis 1 and 2. And to be received with thanksgiving. We thank God always for the food we eat, but more important, we can thank God also for the air we breathe and for everything that God created, including the intergalactic um, expanding universe that he has given us. But more important is also it includes the culture uh, where the imago Dei that God gave to Adam, whatever human beings do with their hands and with their brains, they are good. Ha, huh, thank God for and laptops. And thank God for the things that the human brain and the human hands have created. And someday in the new Jerusalem, eternal city in Revelation 21, the kings of the earth, the Buddhist king of Thailand, the Shinto emperor of Japan, and even the Muslim Ayatollah of Iran will bring the glories of their nation the products of their culture into the new Jerusalem. Now, how? Well, in verse 27 of that chapter, it says that only those who are pure, only those actually who are born again, who have Jesus, can enter the new Jerusalem, whose names are written in the book of life, can only, they are the only ones who can enter, which actually means that the kings of the earth can be evangelized and discipled and be made born again and grow in strength in the grace of our Lord Jesus. Can we aim at conversions of nations, including their leaders? Well, this is the confidence because everything that God has created is good. But they need, this is what, we, and I'm glad the language called creation day. This is God's given to us. And this world is, uh, thank, uh, we can thank the Lord for anything, including perhaps the Buddhist temples and the Muslim mosques and madrasas that are being built around. Why? There is Genesis 3. There is the fall. And so there's a verse 5 in 1 Timothy chapter 4. In the midst of thanking God for everything he has created th through himself and through his creatures, the homo sapiens, the dark and evil and violent 
and unrighteous evil things that are found in this universe because of the fall. Paul says, the grace of Christ Jesus, the mission day, is to sanctify all evil things that has you know, marred or destroyed the creation that we should thank God for. Sanctified by just two things. The two spiritual weapons that God has given to us. The word of God and prayer. And if we can plant prayer and the word of God in any place in this world, including nightclubs, including uh, uh, secret places where pornography is being produced, wherever prayer and the word of God comes in, where there are two or three who declare Christ's lordship in that place, there's the church. Or there are the people of God now who are bringing in God's kingdom in, Christ's grace into that place. And therefore, the amazing thing here is really to say that we all have to become experts in prayer and the word of God to turn and transform and convert evil things, sinful things in this world to be redeemed back into the Lordship of Christ. Which actually means, uh, and this is how we propagate, that like in the early church, every believer can become a disciple maker as long as you are expert in prayer and the Word of God. You do not need to get a PhD in the New Testament. You, any person, even an illiterate woman, uh, living in a uh, tribal area in any mountain uh, tribe, and any Muslim woman who has no chance to get education in a village in Afghanistan or Pakistan, or in Toronto, or in, uh, who are illiterate. They can be used by God, just like in the New Testament. These people, most people, have no chance of education. They don't know how to read. Uh, but it can be done as long as they know how to have prayer and to have the Word of God. And uh, the Word of God is not in written form. It is in memorized form uh, from by the Jews where every uh, Jewish boy uh, grows up memorizing the whole Pentateuch and uh, the book of Psalms uh, as their hymn book. That, that's uh, very simple. And just three habits. If this becomes your life view or your lifestyle, uh, then you know, have to have your own devotions so that you l learn how to pray and master the word of God alone. Number two, have a house church where you together with your family uh, learn how to uh, pray and discuss and apply the word of God. And third, uh, how can you now when you meet a non-believer, how to do friendship evangelism to witness to the reality of prayer and the Word of God working in your life. How Jesus, the grace of God in Christ, works in your life. And share it with a friend, a Muslim friend, a Buddhist friend, a, a, a communist uh, friend. But that assumes that you are full of the grace of Christ, that you can confidently, strongly uh, have the confidence to make friends, and having made friends, to gossip Jesus, prayer, and the Word of God, to train this person to do the same. Which leads us now to the second important aspect of what Paul was telling Timothy what to do. Not just to have this simple spirituality, but to have a simple strategy, how to multiply this. After all, if this world is going to be 
an increasing population, although there are some countries where population is decreasing, but thank God for diaspora so that uh, at least uh, their populations will be maintained. The, the thing is, as the world's population continues to increase, the rate of increase of the Christian population must be double, if not triple, the population increase. And so it has got to be mainly through multiplication. And in the case of Paul, he says in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, well, the God's master plan for world evangelization is whatever you have learned from me in the presence of many witnesses, in other words, in our cell group or in our house church, you find faithful men who you can teach how to teach others also. In other words, a disciple multiplication movement. Uh, just to illustrate, in the uh, Philippine missions mobilization movement, we are training every believer who goes overseas as an overseas Filipino worker, just disciple too. Uh, do a spiritual network marketing of Jesus, prayer and the word of God into the Muslim world, into the communist world. And as I send English teachers to China, Filipino English teachers to China, they are ordinary college students, but have the confidence <laughs> to be able to say that I am an ambassador of heaven. I am a priest of the most high God. I am a temple of the Holy Spirit, and wherever I go, I can plant Jesus into that situation and, and uh, among the people. And just two, may perhaps if you go to China, uh, you get the, their students, uh, one or two of them, to follow Jesus, and let them be the ones now to evangelize the rest of China. When you, a Filipino, will come back and uh, having helped your family with the remittances that you sent over to the Philippines. Uh, in the case of T4T, for those of you who are familiar with what uh, a certain uh, IMB uh, missionary did in Shanghai, uh, how he trained the house church leaders in Shanghai how to evangelize Shanghai by just discipling five each. Each believer can be trained. That's, a, that's why it's called training for trainers. Every believer should be a trainer, a disciple maker, who can disciple five. And that's the way God's word has to spread. Just like in the early church, the assignment given to us is to multiply disciples so that we can make disciples of all tribes and nations. And Paul would continue to say, uh, how you, uh, what kind of discipleship do you give uh, to your disciples in uh, uh, passing it on to others? Uh, do it like a uh, somebody who would get it. And so he would say, endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ. No one should entangle himself with the affairs of this life and just please those who the one who chose him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, this is to be an athlete, uh, he, he will be crowned only if he strives lawfully. And as a farmer, uh, he should labor and be first partaker of the fruits. Well, a farmer expects a yield in three or four months' time. And here in the disciple-making movement, we believe that if a person can be discipled in three to four months' time, uh, and you can see the fruit of your labors uh, almost instantly. Uh, why? 
uh, the Holy Spirit will be with you and will be uh, helping you uh, to be able to be effectively harvesting the reap and to reap the rich harvest in the world that is full of diaspora and full of hybrid peoples. And in the, in the case of the millennials, everyone is able to have not just one or two networks, but a network or uh, networks of different friends. So disciple making movements based primarily on verse two, just anyone to, to become like the perfect man, Jesus, who Robert Coleman has suggested, given to us, the incarnated Son of God has demonstrated to us how to train disciples who will make disciples of the nations. He starts with 12, and this 12 becomes 72. And this 72 becomes 500. And this 500 becomes 3,000. And becomes 5,000. And multiplies very fast. Why? They have just one mission. Make disciples. Well, let me uh, quickly now go to the third one. Verses 8 to 10 uh, talks about what structure do you, and it is a simple structure, where you can have church in the prison, where you have no building, no clergyman, and no uh, uh, written Bible in your hands. That's why we have to start with the simple spirituality. If we have a complex, complicated spirituality to bring to the nations, uh, it will be uh, mission impossible. When we say mission, multiplication of disciples, it is through house church networks. And thank God, we here in Asia, God taught us, primarily through 1949, Mao Chi who helped the church go back to the, to, to the basics, Ad Fontes, where he really helped the church to realize there is another paradigm of being church. There is another paradigm of doing mission, and that is ordinary farmers can multiply God's word and multiply Jesus across the villages of China without having to be going with an MDF. <laughs> and that they, ordinary teenagers, uh, can go from vi village to village, bringing Jesus with them. Exactly. Just like Jesus. Well, you have your disciple of 12. We have to train them how to two by two make their own disciples. I share this mainly as a fifth generation Christian, and I learned it from my first, uh, fourth, my father, who every week, as I was growing up, we would have two family altars. Every Tuesday night, every Friday night, we will have family devotions. And uh, I saw with my own eyes how my father, an ordinary layman, an, a manager, uh, office manager in Southern Motors in Bacolod, he would win one family after another family in Bacolod, a Chinese family, to be able to bring them to church. And every year, two or three families would come to Jesus. And I would really say that about 65 or 70% of all the families that were baptized in our local church, Bacolod Trinity Church, were all brought to Christ by my father. Every Sunday morning, 7.30, we had to leave the house in order to bring the children uh, and help bring the children uh, to Sunday school at our church. But it's very simple. Uh, why? 
Well, he got the benefit of the revival of Dr. John Sung, who was able to bring revival to the uh, churches in southern China and in Southeast Asia, where the Chinese diaspora was, were. And for John Sung, he would organize his converts into groups of three. And these three, even teenagers or 12-year-olds, or would go for, to different villages to spread the word of God the, from the revival of this simple Dr. Jan Sung, although he had a PhD in chemistry, uh, to show his father a Methodist pastor. But the beautiful thing is that just like the Apostle Paul, I hope all of us can follow in his footsteps to be real good diaspora missiologists who will be training our students to two by two be able to transform uh, during their seminary days to learn it two by two. But hopefully after they graduate, they will be able to uh, do it uh, much better one by one. After all, the gospel of the kingdom and of salvation. Jesus, the grace of our God in Jesus Christ has to be realized in all the diasporic communities around the world. It has to be hybridized. It will be contextualized as every group. Uh, 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 and even as I look at my daughter who uh, works with her uh, laptop and even her cell phone, has friends in Japan, has friends in Africa, has friends in Europe, simply as a college student. And so the networks that she has, she has only one assignment from me, smuggle Jesus into your conversations, your chats, and, and in your Facebook page, uh, put in uh, some kind of trigger points where people will ask you, your friends, international friends in your laptop, can learn uh, what it means to have Jesus. May God help us. So in every local church will become a training center for every member of our church to become a disciple maker. Can do DMM, Disciple Multiplication Movements. Just find 12, and perhaps the next time I see you, I will ask you, uh, who are your 12? 12 people who we have transferred. It's not just an intellectual thing uh, of worldview, but it's a lifestyle where they learn how to be Christ followers uh, without uh, being churchy. Uh, after all, we say that Christianity is not a religion. It is just a relationship. And to restore the teaching that every believer has direct access to God in Jesus' name. And wherever you go and help people to pray to God in Jesus' name and learn his truth, his teachings from the Bible. There's the grace of Jesus planted and smuggled in, incarnated into the various structures of society. Uh, and starting with every home will become a church, just like God intended for Israel to be modeling to the whole world that every family is a place where prayer and the word of God is taught. I hope with this condensed uh, I hope my paper, uh, I'll have, as this goes into the book, uh, I, I can be given more space to elaborate on this. But I hope just for, the, uh, for this consultation, uh, these words uh, showing forth from a diaspora missiologist who wrote this from prison and has the church from his house arrest where even Praetorian guards, the special uh, best soldiers of the Roman Empire, would be contaminated with Jesus' germs in that 
prison cell or that in that house that he rented. Uh, that's how the gospel spreads, hybridized, contextualized into the various disciple-making movements which disciple every believer to become a disciple-maker for Jesus. God bless us as we go and make more Timothys and more apostles uh, through the ministries that each of us will go back to in God's simple master plan for world evangelization and world transformation. Amen. <laughs>